Hello, everybody, and welcome to the super fast Instagram Q and A. Hold on, do you hear that? Ugh. One second. Man, my chakras feel so much more aligned. Let's go. Super fast Instagram Q and A. This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and my streaming service, Nebula. Coffee at the ready. Questions at the ready. JS Bach, the well-tempered clavier, at the ready. Thoughts on new Strome song? Some really nice wonky rhythm emo. Yeah, this new Strome tune is wild. Uh, it's called Sante. Check it out. A ceux qui n'en ont pas, Rosa, Rosa. So this tune borrows very heavily from cumbia, which is a style of music very popular across South America. And it sounds specifically like it's a Bolivian cumbia influence because of the use of charango. Charango is that strummed instrument that you hear at the beginning, which is kind of like a miniature five string guitar. I guess it's 10 string with five courses, but yeah, it, it's that thing. Now, cumbia is usually based on a groove, which you can think of as like an eighth note plus two sixteenth notes. You hear that groove in like basically every form of cumbia, but sometimes, sometimes that groove gets morphed a little bit. Like it's not strictly an eighth note plus two sixteenth notes. Those sixteenth notes are sometimes like rushed a little bit. To match that rushed feeling of the charango in a digital audio workstation, what Strome did was actually very interesting. He took a basic dembo drum pattern where the snare hits on the uh of one and the and of two, and he took the snares and moved them a 30 second note triplet earlier than where they would be normally if they were on a 16th note grid. This gives the whole track this particular elasticity in the rhythm that feels like it's sucking you in and out, almost like, like this strange rhythmic side chain or like, I don't know, it has a very particular feeling that I think is cool. On the big synth melody, it looks like he has taken the synth and dragged it a 64th note over from the downbeat. Whoa. So there's almost like this hiccup kind of thing on the downbeat. There's a strange combination of like being delayed on the downbeat, but rushing the snares that give the track its unique rhythmic feel. Strome had to program in these variations, which we might call micro rhythm. Very, very tiny fluctuations in rhythm that give music its feel, which a performer who plays on charango would just do naturally. But yeah, this track is such a vibe, such a cool rhythm. Good stuff, good stuff. Thoughts of Victor Wooten's teachings on 30 keys in music theory is easy video. So Victor Wooten is a childhood hero of mine. I look up to him quite a lot and it pains me to say this, but Victor Wooten is wrong. There are not 30 keys. There are in fact more than 30 keys, which is a strange statement to say, so let's unpack it. Okay, how many keys are there? You'd think that because there are 12 notes, there would be 12 keys, right? Wrong. 12, good answer, but wrong. For many styles of music in the West, we use what's called the tonal system, which is what keys relate to. And in the tonal system, we have two kinds of keys. We got major keys and we got minor keys. 24 is logical, more logical than 12 because there's majors and minors. So we have to double the total number of keys we're working with. So you might think, oh, okay, so there are 24 keys. Wrong. Oh my God, you're so wrong. Makes sense, right? Still wrong. There are in fact 30 and I'll let Victor Wooten explain. 30 is the answer. How many major keys have no sharps or no flats? How many? One. Somebody keep track. There's one. We can have a major key with one sharp. We can have a major key with two sharps. Up to how many sharps? Seven. We can have a major key with one flat. We can have a major key with two flats. Up to how many flats? Seven. So we have seven flat keys, seven sharp keys, one that's neither for a total of how many major keys? Fifteen. Fifteen keys. Some of them sound the same, like G flat and F sharp, but they are not in fact the same key. You spell them differently and you also think of them differently. Double it for a total of 30 keys, my man is right. So 15 major keys and the relative minors giving you a total of 30 keys. But there's more. Let's take a look at good old JS Bach, shall we? 
We shall. This is Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, which is a collection of preludes and fugues. A fugue is a style of music where you take a melody and then you repeat it, but you repeat it in different keys and then you add different counter melodies and you kind of modulate between keys, just getting used to the feeling of the melody in the different keys. There's like a lot to it. This is Alfred Mann's book on just how to write fugues, which is like one particular kind of music from hundreds of years ago. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole thing. Anyway, the important thing to remember about fugues is that once you've stated the subject, the melody, it's important to repeat the melody in the key of the dominant, which is the key that's a perfect fifth above the key that you started. You will always go to the key of the dominant when you play a fugue, at least briefly, at least for a small amount of time. So if we take a look at the fugue number one in C major, we start out with the first two measures in the key of C. There are no sharps and flats. But by the time we get to the third measure, we introduce an F sharp, which means means that we are now in the key of G, which is a perfect fifth away from C. So what happens when we write a fugue in the key of C sharp major? Like C major has no sharps, C sharp major has all the sharps. Well, we have to go to the key of the dominant. That's like a big part of fugues. And by the third measure, we do go to the key of the dominant by introducing this weird symbol. This is an F double sharp. The key of the dominant in C sharp major, a key with all the sharps, is G sharp, a key with all the sharps plus one, an F double sharp, it's so sharp, it's been doubled in sharpness. Now this is wild because this key shouldn't exist and yet it does exist right here. And you can't really deny that it exists because Mr. J. S. Bach himself used the key of G sharp major. So how many keys are there? Could you potentially find keys with nine sharps, 10 sharps, 11 sharps? Well. Maybe, but their use would be extremely rare, and this is an edge case anyway, with a fairly extreme example of sharps in major keys. So to answer the question that Victor Wooten posed, which was, how many keys are there? Okay, how many keys are there? It's at least 30. It's not a very satisfying answer, I know, but there are 30-ish keys. How incredibly sick is Tribal Tech? Oh my God, Tribal Tech is amazing. Scott Henderson, Gary Willis, the other guy, drummers are gonna be very mad at me. The other guy from Tribal Tech. Kirk Covington, yeah. Insane progressive fusion band, love their stuff. The second chord to Stairway? <laughs> yeah. What is that chord? I guessed it on a video that my friend Paul Davids made all about the second chord to Stairway to Heaven and how it's not a very easy chord to name. You could name it C major seven sharp five over G sharp. I guess that's what it is, but it doesn't really capture the vibe of the chord, like the feeling of the chord, or at least what it means within the context of the progression. Because the second chord to me feels like a five chord. It feels five-y. I'd want to name it some form of E, which is the five in the key of A minor. It just has like a, five vibe, right? So I guess you'd have to call that like an E over G sharp add flat six to take care of the C. Anyway, there's no real good answer here. It's just a chord that makes sense within the context of the melody. And uh, yeah, it makes sense on guitar too, which I refuse to play. What's the difference between a C9 and a C add nine chord? Now C9 means a C dominant seventh with the added nine. In this case, a D. You can play that D anywhere. It can be on top, it can be smushed in the middle, you can revoice it any number of ways. These are all C9 chords. A C add nine, on the other hand, means a C triad with no dominant seventh, and the nine has to be up an octave away from the triad. If the D was played in between the C and the E like this, this is a C add two chord. This is not logical at all. This is just something that you have to know through experience. The specific language of chord symbols and what they mean is not really all that standardized and it doesn't really make any logical sense and all attempts at making it more logical have just made it more confusing. Just know that C9 means that you can put the D anywhere and C add nine means you need to put the D on top. D jokes, truly, truly the highest form of humor. Can you write music even if you don't know music theory? It's helpful to think of music theory as a shared language for communicating ideas of sound between musicians without having to play the sound 
first at your instrument. It's just an immediate way of communicating that sound thought from one person to another. The reason why we say things like thirds and D major seven sharp five and two five one is that's the standard way of thinking about chords and sounds. And it's a very useful one for playing different styles of music like jazz and maybe classical music and maybe, I don't know, rock music. But so long as the language is shared among musicians, you don't need to use the standard. You could call this the fuzzy chord if you wanted to, because it makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And so long as your bandmates know what you're talking about, when you say the fuzzy chord, that's music theory. One of the reasons why I think people say that music theory helps you write music is because the process of learning music theory is the process of developing sonic vocabulary, sounds that you are familiar with and have some idea of how to work with. So for example, you might learn about 251, right? Good stuff. You don't need music theory to know the sound at all. And there's so many great musicians who didn't, like Stan Getz, for example. He was an amazing jazz musician who played entirely by ear. You do not need to know the name of it. However, it is helpful to know the names of these things because it is a shared language among musicians of certain styles. And music, my friends, is a collective experience. And my God, is it nice to be able to communicate ideas with my fellow musicians and just be on the same wavelength, be on the same page. That said, there's definitely a point when trained musicians are sitting around and aren't really communicating using the formal language and are kind of reverting back to just playing sounds at each other. Yeah, it's like, uh, with a, yeah, and then, yeah, but then, then, yeah, yeah. 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 Right, right. Yeah. yeah. D major seven, nine, C seven, nine, 13, E diminished seven flat five. So first of all, it's redundant to call it E diminished seven flat five because there is already a flat five in a diminished seventh chord. So just call it an E diminished seven. You might've meant E minor seven flat five. In that case, the progression sounds like this. Ooh, nice. What that is, is the one major seven going to the flat seven, seven. E minor seven flat five is an upper extension of C seven with the nine and the 13. It's like C seven with the nine and the 13 without the C and without the 13. It also kind of sounds vaguely Christmassy if I do dare so, do dare so, do dare say so myself. The first two chords of Christmas time is here. Although technically speaking, that second chord on Christmas time is here is a dominant seventh with the sharp 11. How did Sungazer meet? Are you all Berkeley trained? Yeah, so we met at Berkeley. I believe that Sean and I met at one of the jam club jams. There's a club at Berkeley specifically dedicated to jamming. Like you could go to the jazz jam or the fusion jam or the funk jam. It's a good way of meeting like-minded musicians and playing music with them in kind of like an informal way. After that, I think we played in an ensemble together, which was a fusion ensemble. And I remember very specifically, we played the tune Proto Cosmos quite a lot. Unfortunately, we don't have any recordings of it, but if you know our music and you know the music of Alan Holdsworth, you can kind of hear the beginnings of Sungazer in there for sure. G major seven, G minor seven. Yeah, there's something really cool about this kind of chord loop where you're just alternating back and forth between like a major seven chord and a minor seven chord on the same root. A song that I really dig that does this is Caetano Veloso's Maniata. <laughs> just kind of goes back and forth between the one major seven and the one minor seven. I found that soloing over this kind of loop is actually kind of tricky. Since you're staying on the same root, it has this feeling of stasis, but because you're going back and forth between minor and major, there's this like movement. <laughs> Why parallel fifths and octaves are illegal? No, they aren't illegal. It's just that if you want to mimic the style of like J.S. Bach, maybe don't use them that often. Although, yes, I know technically he used them occasionally. Shut up, don't at me. It's like saying trombone is illegal in metal. Not technically, but if you're trying to mimic the aesthetic of metal, you're gonna have a hard time incorporating trombone. If you're trying to mimic the aesthetic of J.S. Bach, you're gonna have a hard time incorporating parallel fifths and octaves. That said, metal trombone is, uh, is pretty sick. <laughs> 
How do you get the Middle East sound? So I get asked this question sometimes and you see people talking about it in music theory forums and stuff. There's this tradition in the West of reducing Arabic and Persian music down to a scale or a certain scale. And usually it's just any scale with an augmented second in it, which is problematic because it's like a caricature of many rich musical traditions and Hollywood does this all the time. You could see how ridiculous this is by asking the question, how do you get that American European sound? And answering the question with, oh yeah, just use the major scale, which is, I guess, true, but reducing down jazz music and classical music and rock music and really anything that uses the major scale to just the major scale is completely oversimplifying. Same way of reducing Middle Eastern and North African music to just a scale, like it's a caricature of this tradition. Who's the sponsor of this video? Longtime viewers of this channel know that I am constantly under threat of blocking because YouTube has a special relationship with the three major music labels. This means that in any dispute of copyright, YouTube is always going to take the side of these labels over creators. And that is unfortunate because it makes my job here on YouTube with music education very difficult sometimes. So as insurance for this music theory and analysis community that we've got going here on YouTube, I've uploaded all of my videos to Nebula. Nebula is a creator owned streaming service that is not financially beholden to major music labels. So I can upload videos without worrying about getting blocked. It's a place where I can upload bonus videos and videos that wouldn't work with YouTube's recommendation algorithm. Yes, writing for harp. That will definitely get the Mr. Beast numbers. This is why many music analysis and music creators have gone on the platform recently, including Charles Cornell, Mary Spender, Sounds Good, Amy Nolte, 12 Tone, and many other creators from other educational niches. It is a great place to watch and discover quality content that's entirely ad-free, as well as support your favorite creators who have joined the platform. Nebula has partnered with another fantastic streaming service to bring you this video, Curiosity Stream the go-to source on the internet for the very best documentaries with thousands and thousands of titles to choose from, including Fiddlin, an excellent documentary all about old time and American bluegrass music. And bluegrass, everybody steps up and takes a break and tries to improv on top of what the last person did. <laughs> I really dig this documentary. It's a fantastic look into a style of music and a culture that is not very uh, prevalent on the internet. So check it out. If you're interested in signing up for Curiosity Stream, for a limited time, you'll also get a subscription to Nebula for free. You can go to the link in the description or curiositystream.com slash Adam Neely to get one year of both streaming services for just $11.59, a 42% discount that you can only get now during the holiday season. If you sign up with the link in the description, you're not only supporting this channel, but all of the creators over at Nebula as we create a platform that aims to engage with the world in a more meaningful way.